Well, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is the be-all and the end-all of Christian faith. If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then I and other bishops and priests and Christian ministers should just go get honest jobs, and all Christians ought to join another religion. Um, St. Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is in vain, and we are the most pitiable of people. There really is no third option. See, if Jesus has not been raised from the dead, then the whole thing is a fraud and a joke. If he has been raised from the dead, then he is who he says he is, and he must become the absolute center of our lives. C.S. Lewis was right about that. There is no real third option of, oh, I don't think he rose from the dead, but he's a great moral teacher. No, no. If he didn't, didn't rise from the dead, Christianity is a fraud and a joke. That's how central it is. Now, having seen the, the importance of the facticity of the resurrection, what lessons can we draw from it? Well, of course, probably a thousand, but I'll just draw three today. So here's the first lesson. This world is not it. Now, I want to be careful because I don't mean this world is bad. I don't mean we should be ignoring it. What I mean is the world of our ordinary experience, the world of immediate common sense, the world, if you want, of modern secularism. You know, we're the first culture, they say, really in the history of, of humankind that is largely accepting a secularist view of the world. That's just this world. This is it. The resurrection is saying in no uncertain terms that this world, though good, is not the final horizon of what is real. It tells us, as the Bible puts it, that God's about the business of making a new heavens and a new earth. He wants to raise up and transfigure this world. And the resurrection is the great indication of the truth of this. You know, here's something I think is self-evidently true. I think Jean-Paul Sartre and his colleagues, the existentialists, are, are dead right when they say, if there is no God, life is absurd. That's true. That's true. I mean, we can enjoy things here and there in this even us and passing world, but let's face it, there's no God. We all die and we stay in our graves and that's the end of the story. Then life is basically absurd. No matter what I accomplish, it'll eventually fade away. I will fade away and everyone that ever knew me will fade away. What's the point? Being a morally upright person, you say, well, that's important. Well, I guess, but, you know, so someone suffers and dies, I don't do anything about it. The world looks on with utter indifference, and then eventually we all fade away, and then the world fades away. Who cares? Who cares? The, the, the point is, if you, if you accept a completely secularist view of reality, life is basically uh, meaningless. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead, therefore, is this enormously important sign, enormously powerful sign that something else is the case, that God is up to something beyond just our ordinary experience. Here's a second great lesson from the resurrection, that tyrants, your time is up. So think what it meant now for the first Christians. Jesus, their friend and master, is put to death by uh, the power of Rome in collusion with certain of the Jewish leadership. The cross was the great sign of Roman tyranny, Roman authority and power. You know, if, if you get in our way, we will do that to you. The cross was meant to be horrific, which is why they displayed them publicly. Think of Spartacus and his colleagues along the Appian Way. Or in Jesus' case, they crucified him right by the, the gate to the city of Jerusalem, so no one would miss him. I was just reading somewhere very recently that uh, historians speculate the cross would have been about 10 feet high, you know, because they wanted it to be seen. It was a sign of Roman tyranny and power. So when God raises Jesus from the dead, what does it say to the first Christians? It says, no, Caesar's power is not final. He's not the ultimate authority. In fact, his tyranny is under judgment. God's love is greater than anything that's in the world. Now watch how very creative Christians have used this insight to very powerful effect up and down the ages. The best example in recent years is John Paul II in Poland. And I think of... Uh, that scene, 1979, in Victory Square in Warsaw, and he's preaching the gospel, preaching about God, about human rights, about the resurrection, and the Polish government, the communist government, is right behind him. And behind them, symbolically, was the full force of the Soviet Empire. 
The only thing John Paul had, he had no guns, he had no armies or tanks, but right next to him was this giant cross. See, the cross has always been a taunt to tyrants. It's a way of saying to the tyrants, we're not afraid of you. The worst you can do to us, God is more powerful than that. And John Paul, like all the other great uh, Christian social activists over the centuries, knew the power of the cross. That's why we shouldn't privatize it. The, the, the secular society today wants us to privatize the cross. It's our, it's our little symbol of our little peculiar hobby called Christianity. No, no, the cross is meant to be, as it was 2,000 years ago, erected publicly. It's meant to be in the public eye. And we Christians have to keep doing that because the tyrants have to know their time is up. Here's a third lesson I'll draw from the resurrection. That the way of hope opens to everybody. Now, why do I say that? Well, think of the cross is the journey of the Son of God all the way to the limits of God forsakenness. The Father sends the, sends the Son into the world all the way to death. And Paul says, even death on a cross, which is the worst way they could imagine anyone dying. The point is, the Son is sent all the way out to the very limits of human suffering, even, yes, to the point of God forsakenness. So when Jesus says on the cross, God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, what's the point of that? What's the point of it? The point is, he's sent all the way out to get everybody, everyone who's wandered far away from God, look, is now gathered in by the Son. So, as you run as fast as you can away from the Father, where are you running? You're running into the arms of the Son. See, that's what it means, the, the outstretching of the Trinitarian persons. And then in the resurrection, when the Son in the Spirit returns to the Father, he returns, in principle anyway, gathering the whole world. And that's why the way of hope opens up to everybody. When people are tempted to say, and I hear it a lot in my pastoral ministry, oh, look, I mean, God could never forgive me for what I did. Uh, I, I've been so bad. I mean, don't even bother me, Father. I mean, God could never forgive me. No, no, God went all the way out. He went into every dark corner of human experience so that he could draw the whole world back to him. And so that's why the resurrection is a sign of hope. So first lesson, transcendence. There's more to life than meets the eye. Second lesson, the tyrants tremble in the presence of the cross. Third lesson, there's hope for everybody. There's hope even for the most hopeless. Let the power of the resurrection resonate in your own heart and announce it to a waiting world.